From meeting and working with three presidents as mayor, to cliffhangers about floods, famous people, near disasters, and encounters with a ton of interesting characters, this is Tales from the Gym City with former mayor Chuck Schultz. Join us for this reoccurring bonus segment. I'm History of Go-Go's host, Rob Mellon. My parents clearly instilled in me a, a sense of what life is all about and that you're here not just to live and pile up money or fame or whatever for yourself. You're here to serve others. Welcome back, Chuck, for more Tales from the Gym City. And I know you worked for many years helping Senator Paul Simon, and you got a, a great story today about his connection, Senator Simon's connection and relationship with Senator Barry Goldwater, which is pretty amazing. So we have two men opposite sides of the political spectrum, but they have a shared admiration for one another. Um, Years have passed now. Some people may not remember Senator Paul Simon. So who was he? Paul Simon was the son of a Lutheran minister from Troy, Illinois, which is down in Madison County. Most folks would remember him as our senator from 1984 to 1996, very distinctive with his bow tie. Uh, In 1988, he ran for president and uh, sort of put it all on Iowa. We took busloads of volunteers to Iowa, and it was reported the night of the Iowa caucus that he was edged out by Dick Gephardt, congressman from uh, St. Louis. Actually, three weeks later, when they met Rob in Des Moines to tabulate all the precincts. It turned out Paul had won the Iowa caucus. At that point, he'd already dropped out of the race. Paul Simon was not going to go in debt, and he needed to win Iowa to get the boost and the fundraising and on to New Hampshire and so forth. Uh, but he uh, he made a noble effort, would have been a great president. He was well known for his uh, integrity, uh, his intellect. He wrote about 16 books, I think. I used to say that Senator Simon had written more books than most of his colleagues had read. Uh, very much known for his honesty. Uh, when he was running 88 Saturday Night Live, he was a host. And their parody of Paul Simon it was sort of like a 60 minutes expose. OK, we're going to find out the deep, dark skeletons of Paul Simon. And what they discovered was that he had, in fact, gone through the eight item or less counter at the grocery store with 10 items. <laughs> and that it was rumored that he had once torn the tag off a mattress. So that was what they could get on Paul. So Paul, you know, I traveled with him all over the state, Rob, and people would give him, you know, here's a mug from uh, Joe's Coffee House or whatever. Paul kept track of everything anyone ever gave him, always disclosed all his tax returns, but also all the gifts and whatever. And he was a big believer in that because he started out as a crusading newspaper editor down in Troy. Uh, the paper was going to close. I think it was the Rotary Club that recruited him. He was a college student and uh, wanted him to run that paper. Well, Madison County, the whole Metro East area, very corrupt in those days, very corrupt. And he took that on. And as a crusading editor, he got elected as a very young man uh, to be a state representative and then on to the state Senate. And in 1968, He got elected lieutenant governor. The governor was Ogilvy, Richard Ogilvy from Chicago, who was a Republican. Nowadays, governor and lieutenant governor run as a team. But Paul was elected on his own and was a great lieutenant governor. That's my, you know, I've known him my whole life, Rob. My dad was good friends with Paul Simon. Back in the 50s at the Lincoln Douglas Hotel, my father and my uncle Richard, Judge Schultz, who was our chief judge of the circuit for many years. They hosted a Young Democrats convention at the Lincoln Douglas Hotel. The speaker was Alfred Murrah. You remember that name? That's the uh, federal building in Oklahoma City was named for Senator Murrah. Murrah, the federal judge. Yeah, he spoke here. And uh, the Young Democrats elected Alan Dixon president and Paul Simon vice president of their state organization. Of course, the two of them went on, and they were best friends and, in fact, owned a a string of small newspapers together. Uh, They went on to represent us in the Senate for many years. We had Simon and Dixon. 
I worked with both of them. Paul was always concerned about these great issues of the day. We got to solve the water problems and so forth. And Dixon was the guy you went to for streets, bridges, uh, sewer systems, and yeah, they really complemented each other very well. So in any event, Paul uh, runs for governor in 72, gets beat in the primary by Dan Walker, and who went on to win, but that didn't work out well. Paul went and ran two years later for a congressional seat in down the state. So he served in the House until 1984 when he defeated Charles Percy, who had been elected in 66, defeating Paul Douglas. Paul Douglas, who was a great man, great senator, and who was the mentor to Paul Simon and to our current senator who sits in that same seat, Dick Durbin. Dick Durbin was a uh, college kid at Georgetown and became an intern in Senator Douglas's office. Senator Douglas was a war hero. He could only use one arm and he always signed everything. So Durbin's job was about an hour, hour and a half every day, He'd come down after class and just hold the paper while the senator would sign. And of course they got to visiting and became very close and, and uh, Senator Douglas was a great mentor to him and introduced him to Senator Simon. So anyway, it's now it's January 1985. Simon gets sworn into the Senate. Being earnest as he is, he went out to introduce himself to all the other senators and he encounters Barry Goldwater in uh, on the Senate floor, introduced himself as being from Illinois, and Barry Goldwater says, Illinois, you know where Bowen is? And I really thought, Rob, because I... <laughs> I spent a lot of time with Paul Simon. I thought he knew every little town in, every in Illinois, but he could because <laughs> he, he'd been to El Mall, but he uh, he couldn't say that he'd been to Bowen, and he was very honest. And uh, he said, "Why would you ask, Senator?" And uh, Senator Goldwater said, "My mother was born and raised in Bowen, Illinois." So Paul Simon then went back to the Illinois Department of Transportation and arranged to erect a large brown historical marker sign like we have for our Abraham Lincoln Heritage area. And it says, Bowen, Illinois, birthplace and hometown of Josephine Williams, mother of Senator Barry Goldwater. And that sign's right there at the four-way stop on Highway 61 in Bowen. So he has a picture taken and he gets it matted and framed. And now it's a few months later and he sees Goldwater and he presents him with this picture. Goldwater had no idea that this marker was going up, and he was overcome with emotion. He was moved to tears, and he told just the idea that his mother would be remembered in her hometown. He said, I want to go to Bowen. So I am a still pretty young, let's see, in 1985. Uh, I was a Democratic County chairman, and I had known Simon through my family for many years. And, you know, I went to school in Washington, Georgetown, and and, and kept in touch with Paul all those years. So he, or someone, I believe, from his staff initially calls, and, and I said, really, Barry Goldwater at Quincy Airport? We're going to Bowen. Well, it couldn't have been a better day. I mean, it was right out of Norman Rockwell. God bless Bowen. The, the Lions Club put on the fried chicken for us in the park, and it, all these folks came up to visit with Barry Goldwater. Really, uh you know, quite a giant in the history. They probably the, all uh, voted for him, Chuck. <laughs> well, the day. I had no illusions about Chile Township because God bless these folks up in the northeast uh, part of Adams County and southern Hancock and so forth. They're great people, but they're very conservative, and it's very Republican up there. In fact, that became a, our little uh, joke after that because two years later, or no, Five years later, it was 1990. Now I had been assistant attorney general and had this uh, Western Illinois office, which I really enjoyed. But Paul Simon in 1989, he said, I'd, I'd like you to be my downstate political director. And that was if something if you'd asked me as a kid, Rob, I, what do you want to do when you grow up? I'd say, oh, I'll work for Paul Simon. Kind of hard to do that when I'm living in Quincy and you know, I've got a wife, two kids, and a mortgage. But Paul said, hey, I, I live in uh, Macanda, a little town outside of uh, Carbondale. And, uh, you know, we, we'll work it out. And we did. And it was a tremendous experience for me. 
So one day, a typical day, I mean, we, we, downstate political director sounds like a big deal. Basically, I was the guy that drove him all over downstate Illinois, the two of us. So we start off one day, I think we were in Lewiston over in Fulton County and then Macomb. We end up in Carthage right at noon because Paul wanted me to write a check for $27.32 to buy 15 minutes live on WCAZ in Carthage, Rob. And this was after I was in the conference room at the headquarters of Doak and Trump out in Washington. They had this fancy Georgetown office, and and they were our media consultants. And this was a big, high-profile campaign in 1990. We were running against Lynn Martin, congresswoman from uh, Rockford, who later served uh, in uh, G.W. Bush's cabinet as Secretary of Labor. And Roger Ailes, this is before Fox News, but he's running her campaign, and it's going to be a big, high-profile national race. So these these consultants, they make their money on the TV ads. So when Senator Simon says, what about radio? Oh, you don't want to do any radio. They want 15% of that TV buy. Well, we got back in a cab, Paul said, we'll do radio. And that's what he did. He would buy the time. He sits there at WCAZ right on the square in Carthage and says, I'm looking at the most beautiful courthouse in Illinois, which really Carthage does have the best courthouse. And I've been to a lot of them. But he'd invite people to call in. I'd take the phone and give him the message, and he'd talk about Social Security or health care or whatever was on people's minds. So so we get done, and he says, uh, where are we headed? I said, the Adams County Fair, Menden, Illinois. He said, would we go to Bowen? And I said, we could. So we got to Bowen, and he explained to me that Barry Goldwater now, having been to Bowen in 85, his wife has since passed away. He moved to a smaller place and downsized, and he had donated books to the Chilai Township Library in Bowen, Illinois. Barry Goldwater. So we went to the, Barry Goldwater. There's books in there from Barry Goldwater. So we stopped to see him. But unfortunately, the Chilai Township Library right there on Main Street in Bowen, uh, it closed at noon on Saturday. So Paul wrote him a nice note and stuck it in the door. And I was ready to get back to the car. He said, what's going on over there? Well, I think it's a convenience store now, but there was an auction house on that corner of that intersection where the sign is. And I said, well, I think it's an auction. And he said, an auction? Let's go. And when he walked in, the auctioneer immediately recognized him and introduced our senator. And, of course, it's a perfect setup, Rob, because there's a stage, there's a microphone, there's a crowd. Now, Chuck, when he walked in, is it one of those movie scenes where everything just stopped? <laughs> just about. Because the auctioneer stopped auctioning and everybody turned and looked. And here's, here he is with his glasses, with his bow tie, you know, suit and bow tie, and me along with him. And he got up there and he gave a little talk right off the top of his head about small towns in Illinois that he lived in Macanda, population 450. He knew what it was like in Bowen, population 250. And Rob, they couldn't have been nicer. And the ladies made us uh, sandwiches, and gave us some lemonade for the trip down to Menden. And in the car, Paul says, how do you think we're going to do in Chi Lai Township? And I explained to him that uh, Democrats don't do well in Chi Lai Township. But it That's was an kind of a, That's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of a joke. Uh, all through the camp. In fact, election night, and Paul won big, won uh, all, I had 96 counties, won 95. But when he, he was in Chicago and I was in Springfield headquarters when he calls me, first thing he said was, how do we do in Chi Township? Well, I checked, and he carried Chi Lai Township, which had to be Barry Goldwater. The Institute will seek the active involvement of Democrats, Republicans, and independents, and its goal will be public service, not partisan service had to be a Barry Goldwater deal there because it was really something that he came to Bowen and expressed his, uh, you know, love for the community because of his mother. And so that, that's my Paul Simon, Barry Goldwater in, in Bowen's story. But I have a little uh, addition to that because uh, two years later, I'm out in Washington and I had the privilege of being admitted to practice before the United States Supreme Court along with my brother, on motion of my father. So it was a real great little family thing. You know, you you appear in front of that. You can do it by mail, but we got to appear in front of the court. The nine justices, they have a little reception. It's very nice. You know, other people got admitted the same day. 
So the next day, I went to see Senator Simon and uh, Becky and Charles and Jake and I uh, got to have lunch with Senator and Gene Simon, his wife, who was his partner and wonderful in the Senate dining room. And as we were about finished, uh, an aide came in and said, they've called your uh, constitutional amendment for debate, the balanced budget amendment. And Paul said, well, Gene, why don't you take the Schultzes up to the gallery? And uh, I will go. And so we got in the little senators only elevator route. Well, they held the elevator. Two senators wanted to get on with us. And it was Strom Thurmond and Hal Heflin. Now, this is 1992. And we had just about a month before this had the Clarence Thomas confirmation hearing. One of the best Saturday Night Live parody sketches of all time was the Clarence Thomas hearing. And Dana Carvey had portrayed uh, Strom Thurmond. Chris Farley as Hal Heflin, this enormous guy. And Al Franken was Paul Simon. Al Franken, who went on to serve in the United States Senate. Uh, so as we're all crowded in there, and I'm looking here, Senator Simon, Senator F, and Senator Thurman, uh, I looked at my wife and muttered under my breath, I think we walked into a Saturday Night Live skit here. But we we got up and we were in the gallery, and I had seen Paul do this so many times over the years. But in, in typical Paul Simon fashion, as he's making his case for the balanced budget amendment with Senator Goldwater at his side, these two, one from the left and one from the right, the opposite to political spectrum, that both have this conviction that we have to pay our own way. And so Senator Simon looks up and sees my sons, Charles and Jake, and says, I see these Schultz boys, Charles and Jacob, from my home state of Illinois, and they're sitting in the gallery today, and I cannot spend money and put that on a credit card and expect them, this next generation to have those boys pay that. That's just not right. And so, of course, I have that uh, that page of the congressional record. And uh, I didn't get the name spelled right because the guy was just bucking away, but uh, it's kind of a neat little uh, little souvenir. Absolutely. So one other Simon connection, Rob, with Quincy is – in January of 2015, Governor Paquin was about to leave office, and we had been working for a long time. We, meaning uh, John Cornell, who's been just a great leader for the Dr. Eels House, uh, and myself, we were trying to get a pardon for Dr. Eels. And it was a state charge. We had to go through the state. And it was Sheila Simon who served as Pat Quinn's lieutenant governor in her last days in office that got that done. And, you know, she was a chip off the old block, just like her mother and father. But uh, she's the one that after, uh, I don't know, see, we'd have to figure out how many, 140 some years at least, I think, wouldn't it be? No, 170 probably, uh, that Stephen A. Douglas convicted uh, Dr. Richard Eels of harboring a fugitive slave. And I know the case went to the United States Supreme Court, one of only two in the history of Adams County. Uh, but he did receive his full pardon. And uh, that's the only pardon case I've been involved in 40 some years of practicing law. But uh, it was uh, it was a Sheila Simon thing. And so that makes me think of of my friend Paul Simon, who was a great mentor to me and a great, great, uh, great hero of mine. I want everybody in this audience to know that more than anyone else in the United States Congress, he was instrumental in supporting our efforts to pass the direct loan program in 1993, and no one has done more to make the dream of a college education a reality for all American students than Paul Simon of Illinois. The fact that um, those two seemingly s struck up such a close relationship in that short period of time. But Goldwater had been in politics going back to, he was elected to the Senate in 1952. He's originally from Phoenix. So he was born in 1909, which was three years before Arizona even became a state. And his father had married Hattie Josephine Williams, who they called Jojo. And as the sign, as you had referenced, uh, as Josephine was from Bowen. From Bowen, Illinois. Right. And so when uh, he was out in Arizona, his dad started a department store and that's where Barry started. He just started at working at the department store from his father. He got involved. And that in, was a big, successful enterprise, wasn't it? It right? was. Yeah, he was wealthy. And the interesting thing was his mother. So his mother is from Bowen. 
Um, they had moved to Nebraska when she was young after a while, and uh, she came back to Illinois to the Illinois. She became a registered nurse, nurse in Illinois, Illinois Training School for Nurses is what she came back to. And she got tuberculosis right after that. And so oh they told yeah, they told her. That's well, you, why they go to Arizona. That's why she went to Arizona. So her parents are just these farmers, basically, and they were going to be heartbroken. She doesn't even tell her parents what she's going for. She just says, because of my nursing uh, position now, I've been basically moved to Arizona. They don't know she has tuberculosis. So she moves to Arizona. She has no money. She's basically homeless. She lives in these um, this tent village of people who have tuberculosis, who are treated almost like lepers. Yeah. And You know, we had a sanitarium here in Quincy. Out on East State Street. Right, yeah. So she's out there, and she gets better. Well, now she's in Arizona. They're searching for nurses at this point. She has a, a skill that hardly anyone out there has. So she becomes a registered nurse out there. She meets Baron Goldwater. Um, an interesting thing about the Goldwater name, his grandfather was named Big Mike Goldwasser, and he was actually a— Wasser. It was a Jewish from Jewish descent from Poland, and uh, they anglicized the name later, which was pretty much that was very common in, in the United States, and that's where the name Goldwater comes sure. from. So uh, his mother's out there, and she's a registered nurse, accomplished. Mary's the most eligible bachelor in Phoenix at the time, um, Baron Goldwater, and they start a family. And she becomes now, – now, this is really interesting. I know your son will like this. Um, she becomes a golf champion when no women were basically allowed to play golf. She shows up in pants and starts playing golf. She becomes a golf champion. She's a golf champion locally and even in the entire state once Arizona becomes a state. And she, uh, she was a golf champion throughout her life. She also was a very avid. Now, this is she was originally from from Bowen. Um, right. She was a very avid, avid outdoors woman, and she would take the children into the Arizona wilderness, show them how to shoot really? a gun, show them how to fish, teach them survival skills. This was the mother. This was this was she probably Jojo grew up Williams. on fishing too. I'll bet. Yeah, that's right. So then she becomes a very accomplished nurse in Arizona. In 1918, she is one of the few nurses that will deal with the flu epidemic because people don't want to deal with the people with their tuberculosis or with influenza because they're afraid they're going to catch it, and you know, which many of our sure. nurses are dealing with today. So she that was it, yeah. Barry Goldwater's mother from Bowen, wow, Illinois. Well, you know, and uh, I, uh, it seems like she was such an – and here's another thing uh, about her that I – when I was looking into her, um, she was adamant about honesty. And she absolutely demanded that her children were always honest, which Barry Goldwater carried through the rest of his life. Had that reputation, and, and he was – had that integrity that, you know, they say it was Goldwater that really told Nixon. You're going to have to resign. So he, so here's what happens with Goldwater. Because of his, and this goes back to his mother, instilling in him the importance of honesty and integrity, the party turns to him to tell Nixon, you have to resign. So he yeah. goes to Nixon. He doesn't think he has the authority to tell Nixon, hey, resign. That's not in his demeanor anyway. Mm -hmm. But what he tells right. Nixon is because of your offenses or your what you're accused of, you will get no protection from us. And it sent the message. So after that meeting between Goldwater and Nixon, Nixon resigned the next day. Knowing Interesting. when Goldwater told you something, that is, you could take it to yeah. the bank. There is violence in our streets, corruption in our highest offices, aimlessness amongst our youth, anxiety among our elders, and there's a virtual despair among the many who look beyond material success for the inner meaning of their lives. And where examples of morality should be set, the opposite is seen. Small men, 
seeking great wealth or power, have too often and too long turned even the highest levels of public service into mere personal opportunity. And that's the interesting thing. That's the connection. So even though Goldwater and Simon, so politically different, um, but in terms of some of their core values, they're exactly the same. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's why they could respect each other. Even if they had diametrically opposed views, they knew that each was sincere in that view and had the courage of their convictions. His father must have been a strong conservative as well, because uh, when Senator Simon introduced me to Senator Goldwater, and I have a great picture, Rob, with Goldwater on my right and Simon on my left, me in the middle, which is about how you would line it up along the political spectrum. You know, I'm <laughs> probably to the, to the right of Simon, but definitely to the left of Goldwater. You're to the left but of Goldwater, Senator, yes. <laughs> Senator Simon said, uh, uh, Chuck here is the local Democratic chairman. And Senator Simon, or Senator Goldwater rather, looked at me and he said, Democratic chairman, huh? Well, a lot of people don't believe it, but my daddy was the Democratic chairman of the Arizona Territory. And I said, Senator, really? A Democrat? I mean, you're Mr. Republican. And he said, well, you got to understand, in those days, a Democrat in the Arizona Territory would make me look like a Bolshevik. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure he'd use that line on other unsuspecting Democrats, but I bet on it, and I thought it was a classic. Of course, I've used it many times since, and I told him, we got some Democrats around here that— uh, you know, might make him look like a Bolshevik too. But uh, what a gentleman! What what a what a great man! And uh, what a class thing for Paul to host him in Bowen. It, it was it was really special. And uh, again, you are absolutely right that when you get up around the Northeast Township uh, in Adams County, that is some strong Republican territory. You mentioned Josephine Williams was a golfer. I, I often point out to folks, a lot of the farmers up in that area who, uh, as I said, you know, they're great people. A guy gets sick, they'll plant their fields, they'll harvest their crops, but they're very conservative. And the best illustration of that is at Tri-County Country Club, which is a little nine-hole course in Augusta, and most of those guys up there have their own cart. And when you go up there, you'll see that each of them has their own cart shed that they've constructed on their own. So there's about 50 or 60 little buildings just big enough to park a golf cart in, all different, all handmade. Because, you know, every other golf course in the country, they'd have one big metal building where they park the carts and everyone now, would Chuck, share the cart. That's, that's socialism. You're going to have one there building. There you go. That's got to be And it. all the you carts know. in one there building. You know. Share in space. <laughs> put money together and, you know, just we'll take care of ourselves. You know, everybody's on their own. So God bless them. Well, you know, that was the essence of gold. who Goldwater was. Some of those core, what they would consider conservative values, which when he ran for president in 1964, the Republican Party was fractured. They had the eastern part of the, the, the section of the party, which – was more liberal minded the and then, right yeah. yeah and then you had goldwater and it's all about what we would consider mainly the reagan type of republicans yeah, he, was leader. he was he was you know he, he reagan gets elected you know using using goldwater later. philosophy and i cherish a day when our children once again will restore as heroes the sort of men and women who, unafraid and undaunted, pursue the truth, equality, rightly understood as our founding fathers understood it, leads to liberty and to the emancipation of creative differences. All started with Goldwater in 1964, and, and Reagan was a part of that, and uh, you know, they thought about 68 and so forth. But, yeah, he really. Well, he's a Goldwater. Reagan is a Goldwater acolyte. You know, it's Absolutely. about strong military. Um, you know, the government is too powerful. Limit the government's role in people's lives. Independent freedom uh, or individual freedom. Um, but with a, a, uh, a, a core of decency 
underlying the whole thing. That was the whole Absolutely. point of Goldwater. It wasn't it wasn't about uh, being mean spirited. It was just about he believed in rugged individualism and individual freedom. Our Republican cause is not to level out the world or make its people conform in computer regimented sameness. Our Republican cause is to free our people and light the way for liberty throughout the world. Growing up in that type of environment, and his mother growing up You're in right. that type of environment, instilling that in Probably him. Probably a lot of it went back to Josephine Williams of Bowen, Illinois. And, you know, he lived to see himself vindicated. He got, he just, it was a landslide in 1964. Oh, landslide. It, it wasn't even close. No, it was it was a huge year for the Democrats, and it was all the way down. Uh, I remember the uh, the Illinois ticket that year. I was, a, you know, like a ten year old kid. Uh, I packed a confession here. I took some baseball cards off a uh, classmate of mine at St. Peter's School, who figured that Goldwater was a shoe in because around our neighborhood it was all Goldwater signs. <laughs> And I was precocious enough at age 10, Rob, that I was reading Mom and Dad's Time magazine, and I knew Goldwater was going to get killed. It was going to be a landslide, and it was. And so I made a wager with the other guy, and gee, I did get some nice baseball cards out of that deal. You didn't end up with a Stan Musial or something like that, did you? You didn't didn't take him that bad, did you? That's probably what I was looking for. He was my man. Oh, my gosh. Fast forward now to uh, 2000. I got to... uh, be in on President Clinton's welcoming ceremony for uh, Pope John Paul. And I was with the White House uh, advance staff, so I got out to this Air Force hangar at Lambert Field real early. And they said, it won't be anybody. It's not going to start for like three hours. Well, there was a guy already there sitting in the front row. Turned out he was one of the major financial sponsors of the trip, right up there with like Ralston Purina and Anheuser Bush. It was Stan Musial. Wow. Really, you know, Polish Catholic, Polish Catholic. Uh, they, it, he wanted to be part of that, and so of course, I went up there. He's sitting all by himself, and I turned into the six-year-old stammering youngster that you know you were my hero. And but uh, yeah, I had that. Uh, I told my dad uh, later on that day when I got home. I said I got to see this iconic Polish Catholic leader that I admire so much and have such strong feelings about. And I also got to see Pope John Paul. That's a good day. Because, <laughs> That's yeah. a pretty good day. Because <laughs> as much as I wanted to see the Pope, wow, Stan Musial. But that, that was actually very thrilling because John Paul had a lot of charisma and uh, it was really a privilege to, to even be in his presence. But anyway, uh, Goldwater gets vindicated in 1980. With Ronald Reagan, who, as you said, he was a Goldwater follower. Well, George Will has this quote, and I, I'm going to paraphrase, but he says, uh, Goldwater actually won in 1964 if we would have counted the votes in 1980. But uh, <laughs> obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> that happens in politics, doesn't oh, it? Oh, yes. In these movies. Yeah. Uh, what happens in 64, he, he gets labels at, labeled as an extremist. And he's so candid that when they ask him about it, he basically admits it. Yes, I'm extreme for my views and, and so forth. And then, of course, that doesn't play very well and it doesn't go very well for him in the election. They really hammer him on uh, the use of, 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 oh, very famous. Yeah, the little girl was uh, picking the uh, daisy, the petals the off the daisy. Yeah. 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 And uh, then they had the mushroom cloud. That's got to be yeah, one of the most yeah. famous uh, political advertisements maybe, maybe ever. Maybe number one. Maybe, maybe number one. the most uh, famous ad ever made. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Thank you. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think it was set up for LBJ to win anyway, you know, coming in following the assassination of, of President Kennedy. So it would have been tough for Goldwater under any circumstances. But it was a big year, and it was the last year 
for the Democrats in the South. You know, Nixon had Southern strategy in 68. And I think Johnson said when he signed the Civil Rights Act, we're not going to be carrying the South anymore like the old Democrats did. Uh, I think Carter may have carried a couple. He probably carried Georgia and maybe one or two other states. But, but generally speaking, there was a big shift, and that was the last year for that. You know, the interesting thing about Goldwater as well, he didn't vote for the 1964 Civil Rights um, Act, but when he was the manager of Goldwater Department Store, he was the first department store to desegregate department store locally. He pushed for the Arizona National Guard to integrate. Um, He was part of the NAACP there. Um, but then he votes against the Civil Rights Act because he thinks it's a government overreach. So it's an, he's a very interesting character. Yeah. You know, I, uh, in 1964, in the summer, I went with my dad to Washington. And we sat in the Senate gallery as they debated the Civil Rights Act. Wow. And I, I, re- I remember it like it was yesterday. There was a senator with a deep – so it was kind of the character of the old foghorn, leghorn southern senator. But he uh, – at one point, they were putting up all these amendments, Robin, they get uh, the Republicans and the conservative Democrats, you know. Uh, and one by one, they get voted down, and uh, the senator gets up and says, I, I'm going to propose we adjourn, go out to watch, go out to the ballpark and watch, watch the senators play baseball. At least out there, you get uh, three tries before they call you out. And, and that senator was Sam Irvin from North Carolina, who then, you know, I'm a Georgetown University student and Watergate is going on. And we would get on the bus and go down and get in line outside the um, Russell Senate office building, outside the Senate caucus room where the hearings were held. And, you, you know, you get in there and you get to sit in on it for a while. And who, who's leading it? It's Sam Irvin. Uh I had seen all those years before as a kid, but uh, yeah, to get back to Goldwater, uh, we should probably put a marker up in Bowen. And, you know, we've, uh, at some point we need to revisit all the, uh, we've had, I think, five sitting presidents speak in Quincy and uh, we should memorialize all those spots too. I'm sitting in my office looking at a picture of Teddy Roosevelt across from the magnificent Adams County Courthouse. And uh, I've got one here of uh, William McKinley in Washington Park. I think there were 10 or 12,000 people that day in Washington Park. So, uh, yeah, we, we that maybe that's uh, – I don't have enough projects, Rob. Maybe I can <laughs> take that on for the Historical Society. <laughs> we, maybe we could do something. Okay, Chuck, for the last, you know, the last part of uh, our discussion today, could you remind us some of the 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 things that Senator Simon were, were important to him and the things he pushed for in his life? I know education was extremely important to him. Literacy was so important. And with Paul Simon, if he could connect with something and often when we were scheduling things, you know, when he, when he had that personal connection, it would really bring it home. I want to have a record that my children and grandchildren can be proud of. But beyond that, uh, I don't think you should worry too much about um, plaques and, and statues and buildings being named for you and all those kinds of things. I think what you have to do is help people. And that's the kind of, uh, of living memorial that you really want. So there was a woman named Gloria Waddles from uh, Tutopolis. I, as I recall, we were at a town hall meeting, and she gets up, Rob, nervous. She has a paper in front of her, and she says, I'm reading to you the first letter I've ever written. She's probably in her mid-40s. And she wanted to thank Senator Simon for sponsoring this literacy program that she had taken advantage of. And she had been trying to go through life illiterate. And you know, people do that, unfortunately. So Paul took her to Washington, and he had her testify. Well, there's a guy named Dexter Manley who was this uh, – Offensive lineman, I believe, maybe he was defense. A defensive I think he's off- yep, the Washington defensive Redskins. lineman for Washington Redskins. He watched on the local news Gloria Waddles 
And he contacted Senator Simon's office. Senator Simon called him, and he said, hey, uh, I'm a graduate of Oklahoma State University, but I can't read or write. And Paul took him. Now, that took a lot of courage. That's courage. This guy's like 28 years old or whatever. So he testified. So if, if Paul's work, you know, Barbara Bush, when she was first lady, was asked, uh, who's your favorite member of Congress? She said, Paul Simon, because they work together on literacy, anything to do with education, but also the environment. Uh, he was chairman of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Africa, and he worked very hard on water issues for Africa, on getting clean water. Uh, but he also, he was, you know, he was a statesman. Uh, and that uh, that same Doak and Trump that I talked about, these high-paid political consultants that told them not to do radio, in that same meeting, one of them looked at Senator Simon and said, you can't vote uh, against that flag-burning amendment. Uh, Roger Ailes will make that into a 30-second ad, and he, he, he will lose. He will beat you with that ad. That's why they're introducing that, just to get you to vote no, because Paul, even though he served his country in the Army, he defended everybody's right to protest and speech, even if he didn't agree with it or or uh, vehemently disagreed. Everybody had that right. So Paul Simon looked at this fellow across this conference table in Georgetown and said, sir, if I lose my seat in the United States Senate defending the First Amendment to the Constitution, I'm fully prepared to accept it. Wouldn't lose any sleep. The very first class I have I ask, the, like the legislative process class, I ask them two questions. One, what kind of a world would you like to see? And second, what are you willing to do to achieve it? So we don't, we don't have enough guys like that uh, anymore, but he, uh, he was also a great politician, you know, retail. I mean, at a county fair, you couldn't beat a guy like that. And he had been around so long, since the 50s, and shaking hands, he had a phenomenal memory, that when he would go to some big public event and he'd introduce himself, you know, happy to meet you, what's your name? He'd want to know where you were from. When we drove all over Illinois, I would never be able to go. I might be filling up the tank. He'd have to go inside. He'd want to buy his Pepsi, his favorite treat of the day, because that way you could talk to everybody in the convenience store. And where are you from? Oh, I'm from Root House. You've never heard of it. I spoke at the high school commencement there. Yeah, I know the newspaper editor there, whatever. He knew everybody. We actually, Paul Masson was our pollster in 90, and he said he'd never had a candidate that statistically registered when you said, how is it that you formed your opinion about Senator Simon? And there was a statistically measurable percentage that said they knew him. They thought they knew him because they probably met him once or twice. Uh, but uh, he had a unique poll in Illinois because he was more progressive than the electorate. But they would vote for him anyway because he was, he was honest and smart. He's decent. Decent, decent was the best, best description of Paul Simon. Thanks, Rob. I can't wait until next time when we encounter another one of your Quincy stories and take us back down memory lane and remind us of how important our history locally is and how important we are, not just in Quincy, but in Western Illinois and uh, in the tri-state area in general, um, to the history of the nation. And join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go. My religious beliefs, for example, uh, tell me you ought to help poor people. Now, my father lived that. He preached that. He grew up on a dairy farm. And uh, I remember my dad saying, uh, even, even your cows ought to know that you're a Christian. You know, meaning you have to treat animals with respect as well as people with respect. And uh, I believe that's what we have to do. A kind of a basic uh, philosophy in government.
Bye.